I have the pleasure of introducing you to our keynote speaker. Jonathan Eig is the New York Times bestselling author of several books, including Ali, A Life, which won the 2018 Pen America Literacy Award. In his most recent book, which was we are so excited to announce, King, A Life, was not only a part of Barack Obama's 2023 summer reading list, it's a pretty esteemed company there, but also was just long listed for the National Book Award. So without further ado, I'll bring, turn it over to our keynote speaker uh, who has become both a, uh, not only a scholarly colleague and a conversation partner, but actually a really true friend. So please help me welcome Jonathan Icke. Thank you so much. Um, the Israeli writer and philosopher Gershom Sholem once said, that when you're speaking to an audience, it's best to assume that there's someone in the room who knows more than you do. So I'd like to ask that person to please leave. <laughs> I, actually, there may be a lot of people in this room who know more about my subject than I do. So I will um, approach with humility um, as I've approached much of the task of researching and writing this book. Um, and I wanna thank Lerone and everybody at the, at the King Institute and at Stanford for inviting me to be here today. Uh, it, it really is a great honor. And I'm going to talk to you today about 1963 and why it served as such a critical turning point, not only for Martin Luther King Jr., but for our country. Um, I'd also like to talk about some of the new discoveries I made along the way in researching this book, um, helped by some of the scholars who are in this room today, um, and how they shape our understanding of King and that turning point in American history in 1963. Um, but I'll begin where I begin the book, which is December 5th, 1955. And I say um, in the first sentence of the book that on that night, uh, a young black man became one of America's founding fathers. On that day, Martin Luther King spoke to the people of Montgomery. There were thousands of people massing in the streets outside Holt Street Baptist Church trying to get in. Just two days earlier, Rosa Parks had refused to give up her seat on the bus and the community was up in arms, what are we gonna do about this? Are we really finally ready to do something to, to, to force change? They were living in Montgomery, the former home of the capital of the Confederacy, a place where there had been 360 lynchings since reconstruction, a place where they knew the repercussions that might come for trying to fight back. And when they began to look for someone to address the crowd that night, they asked the newest preacher in town, Martin Luther King Jr. He was 26 years old and he was not looking to take any kind of a position of leadership that day. In fact, he had just recently said no when asked to join the board of the NAACP in Alabama. He had a new baby. He was still new in the pulpit at Dexter Avenue Baptist Church. And along with his wife, Coretta, they were still getting used to their community. So when asked to become the leader, when asked to become the spokesman really, he wasn't asked to lead anything yet. When asked to become the spokesman, for the Montgomery boycott. He reluctantly agreed, but he didn't know what he was getting himself into. He rushed home. He had 20 minutes to prepare for his speech that night, which he called the biggest speech of his life. And he said to Coretta on the way in the door, I don't know what I just got myself into, but I've got 20 minutes to prepare. He, he went to his study and for the first 10 minutes, he had a panic attack. <laughs> couldn't breathe, couldn't think, no idea what he was going to say or do. He got himself together, jotted a few notes, Ralph Abernethy drove by, honked the horn, picked him up, and they went over to Holt Street Church together. And King gave the speech that night that would really define the rest of his life, would define much of the civil rights movement, would really set the path for why he was able to achieve as much as he did. And that day, with these thousands of people waiting to be told what they might do, how they might come together, whether they could really finally fight the degradation of their second-class citizenship, King found a message. And it was a message that came from his childhood, that came from the Bible, that came from his studies in the South and the North. And he said to the people gathered there that day, that it may be that the black people of America are the ones who are going to teach America how to be a true democracy. And we may fail in this, but we are right. 
If we are wrong, then the Constitution is wrong. If we are wrong, the Bible is wrong. If we are wrong, the Supreme Court of the United States is wrong. And in that moment, he really gave the people the voice that they needed to hear. But it wasn't just the people of Montgomery who responded to, to this call. It was the national media that responded too. It was white liberals that responded. And over the months ahead, as the Montgomery bus boycott proceeded, we see this transformation and we see Martin Luther King Jr. becoming the focal point of this new movement that people begin to see might actually spread across the country. And I just wanna tell you about one of the, um, I'm gonna talk about some of the research archival discoveries that I made along the way in the book. One of them um, was the collection of papers gathered by Fisk University scholars who went down to document the Montgomery bus boycott. And I know my friend Jean Theo Harris made use of these in her terrific book on Rosa Parks too. But the beautiful thing about those, about those pages gathered by Fisk University researchers is that they were there as it was happening, interviewing people on all sides of the boycott. Um, the women who were walking to work every day, the white men who were driving the buses, the city officials, Rosa Parks. And there was a woman named Dealey Cooksey who was a, a house cleaner working for a white family. And she told the story of how her white boss, a woman she'd worked for for a long time, told her that Dr. King, this, this young preacher was, was feeding you a bunch of baloney, that you were never going to be able to change anything and that you were, you were only hurting yourselves by following this man. And Dealey Cooksey, who had been working for this woman for a long time and whose family income depended on her, said, don't you dare talk about Dr. King that way. That man is sent by God. And she said to the researcher, to the sociologist, we ain't rabbits no more. And the fear that had been instilled in the black community, not just in Montgomery, but all over the country was such an important part of keeping the status quo that it was important that Dr. King was able to give people like Dealey Cooksey the feeling that they could overcome their fear, but also could inspire people around the country to feel like this could change, the country could change. And that was a really important moment. So King goes from Montgomery. And um, I should mention that Coretta, one of my really important goals with this book was to create a more intimate portrait of Dr. King and also to remind you about the people who made important contributions, including Coretta Scott King, who had never, has never really still been given the kind of scholarly work or the biography that she deserves. But I wanted to show how important the people around King were in, in creating this moment, creating this possibility. So um, Daddy King comes to Montgomery the first time that the King's home is bombed and says, you guys have to get out of here. It's not worth risking your lives. And it's Coretta and Martin who say, no, we're staying. And that relationship with Daddy King is so important. Um, the, the relationship between Daddy King and Coretta are both so important. I want to talk about them both for a second. One of the things I found here with the help of Larone and Tanisha was the autobiography of Martin Luther King Sr. that had never been published, written seven years before his published biography, that shows the dynamic that created Martin Luther King, that shows that here was a kid who stood up to his father in some ways, refused to uh, show any reaction when he was spanked as a child. And in a way you can see how that is, becomes a formative experience for King. He learns that taking the upper hand by being more um, morally, taking seizing that moral high ground undercut the power of your oppressor, even with his father. And yet he never learned to really stand up to his father. He would often just you know, tell his father what he needed to hear and move on. But Coretta was one of the few people who was actually able to stand up to Dr. To, to Martin Luther King Sr. I'm gonna take my jacket off here, it's getting a little warm. Um, um, so, you know, Daddy King is a sharecropping, born a sharecropper in, in Stockbridge, Georgia, um, really makes it possible for Martin Luther King Jr. to be who he is because he's fighting the battles in the way he's, best ways he can at the time. But, um, it's not until Martin Luther King meets Coretta, I believe. And by, by the way, Martin Luther King Jr. going to study in the North, going to Crozier Seminary, going to Boston University against his father's wishes is sort of to forge his own identity, to show that he's going to step out from what his father expects him to do. He's finding his own ways to set himself apart. But it's when he gets to Boston University and meets Coretta that he once again falls under the influence of a key person. And I think that she deserves a lot of credit for this. When, when King met Coretta, he was at Boston College, Boston University. She was at the New England Conservatory of Music. And he was dating many women, 
sometimes, you know, usually several at the same time. And yet he said when he met Coretta that she was the one, that she was the one he was going to marry. And it's interesting to ask ourselves why. And one of the other things I found in my research were the tapes that Coretta made while working on her memoir in 1968, right after King's assassination. And on these tapes, she talks about the fact that she considered herself the more experienced activist when they met, that she had been to Antioch College, that she had been involved in student protests on campus, that she'd been to the Progressive Party National Convention. And Martin, as she called him, had not done any of that yet. And I think that's a big part of why he was attracted to her, that she had the bona fides, she had the experience, she showed the guts to stand up to some of these challenges. And he was really moved and impressed by her intellect. And she's the one recommending books for him to read in the early years of their dating. So when the Montgomery bus boycott begins, he knows he's got a partner. As I said, King was not looking to become any kind of a, of a leader of a civil rights movement. Um, he wasn't even looking to become the leader of, of a bus boycott, but he's got these forces guiding him. He's got his mother and his father who taught him from an early age that the Bible commands us to try to build a community that, that we see exemplified, not just to save our individual souls, but to build a community. He's got Coretta saying, we have a responsibility to be activists, to fight for justice. So the pieces are coming together. And the Montgomery bus boycott also brings together people who wanna use King to help spread this nationally. The idea that we can duplicate this, we can replicate this, we can get the country to respond in the way that the people of Montgomery respond. And you have people like Bayard Rustin, you have people like uh, Lillian Smith, you have people like um, Glenn Smiley coming to Montgomery and saying, this man is special. This man might give us the, the voice and the message that we need to really make this a national movement. And um, it doesn't go so well right away. You know, um, when they try to duplicate Montgomery, it doesn't always succeed. And King, to his credit, adapts to these failures, adapts to what he learns from in places like Albany, Georgia and St. Augustine, where they attempt to recreate the magic, but it doesn't always happen in part because people are learning to respond to King. But King is constantly learning from the people around him. He learns from the, from the freedom riders. He learns from the lunch counter protesters in situations where he sometimes takes a back seat where he lets the younger people lead He's nevertheless learning and polishing his message, polishing his skills. And he recognizes that part of his great gift is that he can attract the national attention in a way almost nobody can during these other movements. So by the time we get to Birmingham, we get to 1963, um, King has a track record of some failures and he's not sure what's going to happen in Birmingham. You know, we, um, we talk about Birmingham being planned as a um, plan for conflict, that they anticipated that they were going to get a reaction from um, the officials in Birmingham and use that to try to turn the media and to try to gather attention for what they were doing. But it didn't always work and it wasn't working so well in 1963 when King got to Birmingham. And it wasn't until really this desperation move that comes when they bring the students in as protesters, they bring the students and let them march because the ranks are being depleted. I mean, let's remember that King is having a hard time recruiting in Birmingham. Even a lot of the black ministers are reluctant to support him. And when Birmingham finally captures the nation's attention, it's in part because of the police reaction to those innocent protesters. And it's JFK who kind of jokes with King, who says, you know, Bull Connor did more for civil rights than anyone else. Um, imagine how, how King felt hearing that, you know, the insult of that remark. But um, when we get to 1963, I think of it as a turning point because we see the nation starting to respond in a way that it began to respond in Montgomery, but only in fits and starts. And we see in 1963, the televised images of those protests in Birmingham. We see the picture of the police dog attacking innocent civilians in Birmingham. And we see the nation beginning to say, including JFK, who's been on the fence, who's been reluctant to put forth civil rights legislation, we see people finally beginning to say that something must be done. And that's because King has helped focus our attention, but all the protesters around King, all the people willing to risk their lives have helped focus this attention. And when we get finally to the peak moment of 1963, the moment that um, everybody associates with Dr. King most, 
the March on Washington, it really feels like a potential turning point in American history. And I wanna talk about that for a second because this really is a critical moment in our history. It's a critical thing that I think we'll be talking about in the next two days. The March on Washington was not widely supported by most Americans. I think 70% of Americans were opposed to it even happening. The president tried to discourage it from happening. There was a fear that it would erupt in violence. There was a fear that it would damage attempts to um, get civil rights legislation moving along. And um, King and the others insisted, persisted, and felt like it was important to keep the pressure on it. They weren't going to um, play ball. But of course, even Malcolm X was calling it the farce on Washington before it happened, that this was you know, that it was playing into the hands of the administration, that it was cozying up to them too much. So King, as always, is being pushed from all sides, um, you know, can't please everybody. But the march becomes this really beautiful moment. Um, we remember it for King's speech, I have a dream. We forget that, the, that it was a march on Washington for jobs and freedom, and that the first half of King's speech talks about police brutality and economic inequality. We conveniently forget that part. Um, and I think one of the reasons that I thought it was important to write this book is that we often water down King's message. We often choose the safe parts of the story that we want to tell. We forget that he was radical all along um, as um, Tom Jackson wrote in his book. We forget that he was attacking Northern racism all along as Jean Theo Harris has written. And we forget that the March on Washington speech, the I Have a Dream speech had a first half and not just a second half. Um, and, we, and nevertheless, this moment really seems to be offer America an opportunity. And I think average Americans feel like this may be time that we may finally be ready to put our history of racism and second class citizenship and these um, dual societies behind us. We may be ready to become one America as King said in 1955. And we literally see nationally televised black and white people together holding hands and singing in harmony and we see people saying after that speech that they're ready to change their lives. I interviewed somebody who said that he would never put a photo of his wife. He was married to a, a white man married to a black woman, would never put a photo of his wife on his desk until after the March in Washington when he felt like we're changing, we can do this now. Um, and I interviewed a, a guy who was um, standing next to King at the March on Washington, Gunny Gundrum, the, the park ranger. If you've ever seen the photos of King, there's this tall white guy with a big hat standing next to him. Gunny Gundrum um, said he'd never really thought about race uh, growing up. He was a white guy living in upstate New York, never met a black person, was very comfortable with the N word as most of his family was. And yet when he stood there and saw the reaction to King that day, he kept moving the microphone in. He kept adjusting it because he wanted to make sure people heard this man. He realized how important this man's message was. And it was an act of love really from, from Gunny Gundrum. And, and that's the moment that we seem to be at in this country. I think there was a real sense of hope even among cynical white journalists covering the event that day. And yet it is this turning point because what happens two days later, what happened on October 10th, 1963? Um, well, two days later we get a memo, I'm sorry, October 10th, it's moving forward a little bit. But two days after the March on Washington, the FBI produces a memo written by William Sullivan that says, personally, I believe in the light of King's demagogic speech yesterday, he stands head and shoulders over all the other Negro leaders put together when it comes to influencing great masses of Negroes. We should mark King, he said, as the most dangerous Negro of the future. And we should pause there and think a little bit about why the FBI would respond to this moment that so many Americans responded to emotionally and lovingly. Why the leaders of our law enforcement agency, the leading, leading law enforcement agency would see this as a moment of threat. Why would they see King as the most dangerous Negro in America? And Lerone Martin has written about this in his new book, but I think the answer is pretty clear, it's racism. And not just the racism of J. Edgar Hoover, it's the racism of our nation, of our law enforcement officials, of our government. It's the desire to maintain the status quo, to maintain the existing power structure for the people in charge to stay in charge. And 
as I write in my book, J. Edgar Hoover may have been one of the few who correctly perceived that Martin Luther, Martin Luther King Jr. posed a fundamental threat to the American society. If your version of, and that's, that's, it's a threat only if you view that as a bad thing. If you view change as a good thing, if you view equality as a good thing, if you view greater justice and democracy as a good thing, then it's not a threat, it's an opportunity. So it's a matter of perception and J. Edgar Hoover perceived this as a threat. And immediately after that, the FBI requested wiretaps on King's phones, on the phones of his associates. And on October 10th, Robert F. Kennedy authorized those wiretaps. And we began listening, we, our country, Americans, our government began listening to private citizen, ostensibly at first in the beliefs that he might have communist ties, when it became clear that he was not the least bit interested in communism, that he was fighting for democracy, those authorizations were, those, those wiretaps were reauthorized. Why? Because King had been heard on the phone talking to women. And why should that be a threat to American democracy? Well, it wasn't, but it was an opportunity. It was a weapon that the FBI could use to try to damage King, to damage the civil rights movement, and to, as I said, to maintain the status quo, to keep the people who've been hoarding power in power. So this begins a new chapter in King's life. He was not a happy man. Um, he was not, as I said earlier, seeking to be the leader of a civil rights movement. And this only increased the strain on him. He had people coming at him from all sides. He was criticized by civil rights activists, younger, more radical ones, seemingly more radical ones. I think King was as radical as, as many of them. And he was being attacked by his own government. And he was aware that he was under constant surveillance, and he was aware that the FBI was leaking this material to reporters, to members of Congress, um, and of course, as we know now, that they were compiling a, a collection of tapes from his hotel rooms and mailed that letter to his office in the hopes that his staff and that his wife would, would hear this tape and read this letter. In this letter that was accompanied the tapes, King was told that the only way out for him was suicide. So he's under this constant attack from our government. And I think it's important, and Gene and I wrote an op-ed about this for the New York Times. It's important to recognize that it was not just J. Edgar Hoover, that King was being attacked and this attack was aided by many people. And that even the news media, which patted itself on the back later for not writing the story of King's infidelities was complicit in this. And one of the other discoveries I made, David Garrow suggested to me that I should check the papers of Mildred Stiegel, who was, King, who was LBJ's secretary, his personal secretary in the White House. And Mildred Stiegel in her safe kept the most important documents that came into the White House and to the Oval Office, including the tapes that LBJ made when he was recording um, his phone calls, including his financial documents and the letters that came in from J. Edgar Hoover. So it turns out, as we discovered, that J. Edgar Hoover was writing to directly to the president, sometimes several times a week, more than 250 letters over the course of just a few years, mostly gossiping about Martin Luther King's sex life. This was not important federal business in any way, it, unless you believe that King really is a threat to you and to your, to your um, hold on power. But it also became something that they seemed to enjoy, that they seemed to enjoy having power, having information on him and gossiping about his sex life. And when we think about the impact of the campaign against King, we often think about the fact that it may have led people to be tempted to assassinate him. We think about the fact that it certainly put emotional strain on him, but we should also think about how it changed King's effectiveness because members of Congress were gossiping behind his back and knew and calling him a hypocrite. Reporters, though they weren't writing about this, knew about it. How did it affect his press coverage? And one of the remarkable things about King, I think, is that in the face of all this, knowing all this, he never backs down. When J. Edgar Hoover publicly in a press conference calls King a liar, America's most dangerous liar, what does King do? His, some of his allies, some of his, King's friends encourage him to go after J. Edgar Hoover. Call him out, take him on, don't let him bully you this way. And King won't do it. 
King always seizes the moral high ground. He says in, in response to J. Edgar Hoover's press conference, well, the, the director must be under enormous pressure. So in addition to absorbing this over and over, King refuses to back down. He, re he, he reminds us over and over that he's a preacher, not a politician. And he is going to do what he believes the Bible instructs him to do, which is to love his enemy, which is to fight for justice. And that means as increasingly, as he becomes more successful and more powerful, that he's not just going to stick to civil rights, that he's going to speak out on issues of human rights. He's going to speak out on economics, that he's going to speak out against war. And when they win the Nobel Peace Prize, when he wins the Nobel Peace Prize, Coretta says, now we have a greater responsibility than ever to speak out on these other issues. And you see him beginning to do that, often prodded by Coretta, especially when it comes to Vietnam. And King knows that all of this is going to further infuriate his antagonists. He knows it's going to further irritate President Johnson. And yet he keeps going. And it's remarkable. He begins to um, travel north and speak out more openly. He moves to Chicago, my hometown, moves in to North Lawndale to an apartment in a, in a dilapidated neighborhood to point out how bad housing inequality is there, to talk about school segregation in the north. And he's taking a beating for all of this. And he continues. And I just want to say that um, We see over and over again this advice coming from even his friends saying, you know, let's just dial back a little bit. Let's just focus on what we're good at. Let's just work where we're most effective. People who had once been pushing him to become more aggressive, more radical, people like Bayard Rustin, people like Stanley Levison. And King is saying, I can't do that. I have to speak out or else I'd be a hypocrite. And there's this one really painful phone call. Um, and we have the transcripts of these phone calls um, from the FBI. Um, one of the great ironies of the FBI's scrutiny of King is that we, of course, know more about his flirtations with women. Um, and it's frankly sad to hear him on the phone talking to some of these women. But we also get a glimpse of his humanity we can hear how worried he is that even his friends don't seem to understand him. We can see how upset he is that America doesn't seem to be listening to him anymore, in part because these newspaper editorials who had once, newspaper writers who had once been great allies of his and great supporters of the civil rights movement are turning on him and saying he doesn't have any right to speak out on the Vietnam War, never mind that you know, he's won a Nobel Peace Prize. But in one of these calls with Stanley Levison, it's right after what I consider his greatest speech, the um, speech at Riverside Church beyond Vietnam on April 4th, 1967, exactly a year before his assassination. King really summarizes his philosophy and talks about why he has to oppose all hate, why he has to oppose all war, why it would be hypocritical not to speak out about these things and not to, and it would be hypocritical not to point out that the greatest purveyor of violence on earth right now is the American government in Vietnam. And the next day, Stanley Levison, one of King's closest friends and longest advisors, calls him and says, I didn't like that speech. It didn't sound like you. And it's, it's only going to hurt our cause. It's only going to hurt fundraising in the North. It's only going to you know, further cost us the support of politicians. And we can read the transcript and we see King say, to his dear friend, I thought you knew me. Don't you know who I am? I'm, if, if, what I did and what I said might have been politically unwise, but it was not morally unwise. And for King to still have to explain himself at this point and to feel like nobody's listening to him anymore. You know, it's so easy for us to um, celebrate our heroes when they're dead. And it's so hard for us to find heroes who are still alive because we expect perfection. But King suffered and he had doubts of his own and he had moral failures. But it's important to recognize that he was struggling and still trying to do what he thought was right. And that's so rare. So what do we see after that speech 
on April 4th, 1967. He begins planning what he thinks will be the biggest and most important campaign of his life, the Poor People's Campaign. And he's going to expand his vision. He's going to talk not just about civil rights, he's going to double down on everything that he's been saying all along. He's going to plan a campaign that takes on poverty and economic inequality in the most fundamental ways. Uh, he's going to insist on a reshaping of American capitalism, something to make it more just and equitable. He wants to, and he's got specific plans. He wants to talk about economic, um, guaranteed income, guaranteed jobs. And he begins to try to gather people to meet in Washington. In, a sense, in, in essence, it's, it's Occupy Washington, DC. They're going to stay on the mall in Washington until the government agrees to really make the kind of fundamental change that we need, that civil rights legislation, voting rights legislation, fine start, but it's never going to be enough unless we really look at the root causes of, eco, of inequality in America. And it's not going well. King's own supporters, King's own advisors, members of the SCLC are saying, we don't know what we're doing here. It's not getting any traction. They're having a hard time recruiting people to come. And at the same time, King is being asked to come to Memphis to support striking sanitation workers there. And again, his advisors say, we can't do that. It's a waste of your time. It's a local issue. But King is a driven by his morality. He says, I have to help. These are poor people who are being treated badly and I have to speak up for them. So he goes to Montgomery, I'm sorry, he goes to Memphis. And it doesn't go well, there's violence during one of his first marches there and he feels compelled to go back. And the FBI is now even more concerned in part because of King's um, talk in, in opposition to the Vietnam War and also in part because they really feared that the Poor People's Campaign, this occupation of Washington could be a serious threat to the government. The FBI is now increasing its attacks on King. They sent a memo out in the early days of 1968 called the Messiah, I call it the Messiah memo and says that now that Malcolm X is dead, King is really the only figure who might become the black Messiah, someone who can unite the black community and insist on change. And we must do everything possible to keep that from happening. And that memo was sent to every bureau office in America. And King goes to Memphis and the newspapers are told what hotel room he's staying in. And he speaks on April 3rd, 1968 at a rally um, for the striking sanitation workers. And he gives one of the most emotional speeches of his life. He really summarizes his entire life and his career that day. And he says, like anyone, I'd like to live a long life, but I'm not concerned about that now. I just wanna do God's will. And God has allowed me to go up to the mountaintop and see the promised land. And I may not get there with you, but I want you to know that we will get there. And he really almost collapses in the arms of Ralph Abernathy after that speech. And then the next day, he's back to work, planning for another march, which is set for a week from that, that day. And as we all know, you know, he's standing on the balcony of the Lorraine Motel, getting ready for dinner, talking about what they're gonna be eating that night, joking with Jesse Jackson down in the parking lot, who was not originally invited to dinner, but King is laughing and saying, yeah, you can come. And, Jesse said, I'm sorry, I already invited myself. And his driver says to King, you know, Doc, it's getting cold. You might want to go in, back in and put on a jacket. And King says, okay, I will. And he turns. And those are his last words. Okay, I will. I wrote this book because I wanted to give readers a sense of King as a person again. And we've turned him into a national holiday and a monument, and we've forgotten that he was flesh and blood. And when we do that, we run the risk of making our heroes icons and forgetting that you don't have to be perfect to be a hero, and that if we expect perfection of our heroes, we're never going to have any. I also wrote this book because there are just too many parallels between 
the 1960s and today, between 1963 and today. And that King warned us about so many of them. Finally, you know, I wrote this book because it seemed like America heard King's words once that we were eager to embrace his message. And we shouldn't lose hope that that can happen again. Sometimes it feels like we are living in hopeless times, but if you think about the times King lived through, if you think about the pressures he lived through, if you think about the attacks he endured, I think we should ask whether it really is more hopeless today or whether we are just inclined sometimes not to take up the fight because it's dangerous, because it's hard. So I wrote this book because we listened to King's words once and I hope we can listen to them again. And I hope that when we do, we might all feel like we can say, okay, I will. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, we have some time for questions. Now that I've stopped sweating, we can relax. Yes, um, there's a microphone too. Um, if somebody has a question, well, we're all among friends here. They say that that's always the, the most brilliant person who asks the first question. Thank you. When you were talking about how King would um, push back and not say anything when he was attacked and that he was like, no, no, it's, I'm summarizing, not as articulate as you would, it's, it's about the work and the mission, I'm not gonna say anything. Um, I was wondering what you think, A, if he hadn't done that and was a little more, pushed back more on when he was attacked and B, I, just everything that's gone on in the world in these last couple of years, it seems that that does not work when we, they go low, we go high. So I was wondering what you thought about all that. <laughs> I think we should all talk about that because actually that was the subject of this really passionate discussion I had last week at Morehouse. I was talking to a group of about 40 students and we got into that in, in great detail. A lot of the students felt like this whole respect thing is overrated. I don't want, you know, well, actually, it was saying this whole love thing is overrated. I want respect. I want power. Um, I, I'm not going to turn the other cheek. I think that it's, all, it's, and it was hard in King's time too. You know, he heard that from not just Malcolm X, but you know, lots of other activists, and especially as the civil rights movement moved along and progressed and matured, um, a lot of people felt like there was time for turning the other cheek, but you can only do that so much. And um, I don't know if, and I certainly when I talk to young people today, the idea of nonviolence is really hard for them to grasp because we're living in such a violent society. But um, I wonder if anybody else in the room might want to comment on that or I'm sorry, did I? I'm not saying to be violent. I'm not saying. I think that just because you respond doesn't mean the response has to be in violence. But it's just not taking crap. I mean, so excuse my language, but yeah. I mean, so I my, my frustration as a human being is that there's a middle ground, and I feel like it gets lost. And right now, your response was about it's not about violence. Right. It's about not. It's about it's about standing up for yourself and and correcting um, being attacked, not putting up with being attacked. And so it was interesting your response because it doesn't have to be violent. No, that's fair. And King certainly would agree. And King would say that not responding was showing greater strength and, and moral um, superiority. And that when you, and this is something that Howard Thurman wrote and Gandhi wrote, when you take away the moral superiority by showing that you're not going to respond to, to their low attacks, to their violence, then you weaken them. And that was certainly effective for King. The question is, is it still effective today? Uh, especially in this age when he who shouts the loudest seems to win. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.
Another question? Thanks for the talk. And it's a really fabulous book. It's really impressive. I wonder if you would talk about the FBI records and the, and I, I'm curious about your thoughts about the ethics of using records that were, you know, obviously used to destroy somebody that were created to destroy somebody and without his, you know, obviously without his permission, often without his, but, but I'm actually more interested in your thoughts about the inaccuracies of the records. So, I mean, with many of them, we know that they were inaccurate, right? And so just use, how do you use it? I mean, or, or even why, you know, is it methodologically, mm -hmm. how do we make sense of a record that is probably a fabrication? Um, yeah. And um, so- That's a great question. I'd like to hear you. Um, and on the question of the ethics of whether we should be even using the material, I have to be honest, I never thought about that. And I think it's a great question. Um, but in terms of the accuracy, I gave a lot of thought to this and I, I feel fairly confident based on people I've interviewed who were on, whose voices were captured on those transcripts that the, the transcripts of telephone calls are widely believed to be accurate. So Andy Young, Stan Levison, Bayard Rustin, they all heard their, they all, they all read the transcripts of their own conversations and said the FBI was recording them accurately. So when we have typed transcripts of telephone conversations, I, I operated under the assumption that those were probably accurate. And we have memos written describing the conduct or the beliefs. I took those with a great deal of skepticism because we know memos are being written very often to please J. Edgar Hoover. And in fact, uh, the very first memo that uh, I cited, the one that said that King was a great threat, was in response to an earlier memo that said King was not a threat. And when it came to communism and J. Edgar Hoover was outraged, and a follow-up memo was written saying the director is right. Um, you know, we must not let down our guard on King, and we must view him as a great danger. So those memos, and and certainly when it came to, um, there's one very controversial memo on King where he, uh, where the, a handwritten note in the margins of a memo saying that he may have been in the room during a sexual assault and may have encouraged that sexual assault. I viewed that with a great deal of skepticism and debated whether to even include it in the book at all. Um, it had been um, widely reported in the press. And um, at the same time, I found more evidence um, based on interviews I did with Justice Department officials to suggest that that handwritten note in the margins may have been untrue. Um, so I felt like it was important to include it in the book because, in part because I could provide evidence that might knock it down. Because um, there were people who'd listened to those tapes that said they had not heard anything that sounded like a sexual assault with King in the room. So, but those, those, those are really tough issues. And I do think that um, we have a responsibility to be extremely um, critical of the FBI's work. Um, at the same time, as I said, it also, you know, inadvertently helps us to help create sympathy for King to see just how much he was suffering and how much he was tormented by the result of the, um, the FBI's work. Thank you for a wonderful talk and for, uh, for writing this book. Um, I want to ask you to elaborate a little bit more on the parallels between 1963 and now, or maybe even more specifically, 1963 and 2020, 2021. So that was a time when, in the aftermath of George Floyd's murder, the consciousness of the nation was lifted like never before around these issues, and yet we don't have a singular, we don't even have two or three figures, at least that I could point to, who kind of turn activism, who turn the race consciousness into organizing. Um, and maybe I don't see it because we're in it. And maybe 10 years from now, it'll become obvious who those people are. But I wonder, do we have a king today? Do we have a parallel to that singular or two or three figures? And if not, why? I see Jean shaking her head. Maybe she wants to comment on this. Do you want to take a, take a shot at that one? Is somebody, Jean, you want to say something before I do? Well, it's nepotism. So, but I'm going to say it, which is 
you know, I think Reverend Dr. William Barber and Reverend Dr. Liz Theo Harris and the Newport People's Campaign is, you know, I think similar to what, you know, what the way that King is covered, whether it's in 63, you know, or 68, right? I think that we have a mistaken assumption about how he's being covered in 63 for one. Um, one of my favorite finds is they actually suggested nationwide boycott of Christmas shopping after the Birmingham street bombing. And the New York Times writes the most crazy editorial about this. So I think it's important to remember that like what we think 1963 looks like doesn't. But I also think this notion that we don't have heroes today and we don't have people doing the work today is really like, and again, I mean, she's my sister. Um, but I mean, if you see the kind of work they're doing, if you see the kind of, I mean, buildings, I mean, both building on the people, um, but also the incredible, um, all the different, you know, struggles. I just, I get, I was shaking my head because I, I just feel like there, there's such organizing happening now. Um, and yet we're like, it's not being covered, right? And so we're, they're covering the, the backlash against us, right? Um, you know, the, all the crazy book bans and then not covering all the teachers who are like breaking them and doing all sorts of courageous things. And so anyways. Yeah, no, I, I thank you, Jean. I think that's, you said it better than I could have. And I think the, you know, the, the part of the reason for that is the media. We have a much more fractured view of what's going on in our country. It's harder for, um, for leaders to emerge and, and to gather consensus. Uh, we are all split into our little silos. We see that in so many different ways, politically and, and in terms of activism. But, uh, you know, as I said earlier, it's a lot easier for us to celebrate dead activists than live ones. Back over here, yes, my favorite person. No, yeah. So this is about um, leaders and infidelity. So I was curious what your thoughts were as an author who's written several books. I'm, I'm excited to read this. I haven't read it yet, so I don't know how you cover it, but I sometimes feel that the, the infidelities, the, the, the cheating on their partners is um, whitewashed and um, a lot of history is not talked about. And I just wanted to know if you agree with that. And I wanted to know your perspective on how do we view someone like a, a King or a Kennedy or a Clinton um, <laughs> when we as a society hear about things like that. Thinking about this as a person who works in gender equality is I'm torn um, because I also think that um, people go, oh, well, it's okay because all the great that they do. So I don't know. I was curious what your thought was on that. That's a tough question. It's complicated, obviously. And we do tend to overlook it or accept it and say, well, they were great and they did so many wonderful things. They don't have to be perfect. And um, certainly today we're living in a society that seems to care less about um, morality. You know, we, we don't go to church as much as we used to. We don't hold people to the same high moral values. And maybe Bill Clinton and Donald Trump have helped us down that road. Um, but um, I think that um, it's interesting to me to think about how it mattered in King's own lifetime. And, and we can all read, and I thought it was important to include it in the book. And Jesse Jackson argued with me. He said, I don't think you, need to have, you needed to have that in the book at all. And Andrew Young said he thought I, I handled it really well. And it was important that it, I, I think it's, it's interesting to th forgetting about how we perceive it now, because I think today's readers are much more open to King's flaws. And, and if anything, in my response, the people, the res feeling I've had in talking to people about the book who have read it is that they find him more relatable and um, greater in any ways because he's human and um, he seems more real. Uh, but if you think about it in his own time, or if you think about it in the own time of, of these uh, other people, you know, we were talking about historical figures. I think it's important to think about how it affected them in their own time. And it, certainly the backlash, uh, the, the punishment that King endured for his 
sexual infidelities, but also how it affected his marriage and how Coretta perceived it at the time, because Coretta clearly knew about it. One of the um, tapes that I found that she made in 68, she talked about discovering that he was seeing another woman while they were still dating, um, when they were engaged. So she clearly knew and decided that their work together was important enough for her to put up with what, a lot of things she had to put up with, not just sexual infidelity. So um, I, I try to think about it, you know, in the context of their, their lives. And it, it's too hard for me to grasp, you know, what it means now versus then or how we should perceive their, them as historic figures. Um, because as I said, you know, every, every great person is going to have flaws. And um, for someone like King, who's a religious leader, his moral flaws are, are more important, arguably. He views himself as a preacher more than anything else. And yet he knows that he's preaching um, and he's not living up to his own preaching sometimes. Can you share with us what Jackie Jackson said? But why did he kind of hold what he said? Um, well, to be honest, he has Parkinson's and it wasn't a, a really, I wasn't able to really have a long detailed conversation, but he just felt like it didn't need to be in the book, that it wasn't that important. Um, it was not that important. Yes. Yeah, I have kind of a follow up on that. Jonathan, thank you so much um, for this talk and this book. Um, I was curious, you mentioned that the FBI's blackmail of King made him less effective. And I was wondering if you could give some examples of him sort of weighing that question of hypocrisy or whatever you mentioned, if you could share a little bit more in the sources. And then I'm also curious by if that caused him to move in a less political direction and in this more moral direction, um, because as a preacher, I feel like he is cognizant of the fact that it's not about him, that he is a spokesperson for millions of black people in the South, ordinary black people who are really embodying this struggle. If that kind of helps him to differentiate, if he is acting politically, then the FBI's blackmail campaign perhaps is more effective. Hmm. But if he is a moral spokesperson, the Bible's certainly not dependent on his personal life to be true. And the efforts of millions of black people in the South who he's representing are also not dependent on that. So do you think that in his mind, that's sort of a, a helpful switch? That's a great question. And I hadn't thought about it quite that way before. I, I do think we can see how it's affecting his effectiveness. Um, you know, Gene mentioned this um, attack in 1963 on his proposed boycott. Um, by then, the media knows about his, his affairs, and, and the people writing those editorials know that he's morally compromised. So there's going to be just a greater degree of skepticism in everything they write about him, I believe. And he is trying to move policy. He is trying to affect change on a legislative level. And that becomes harder when the members of Congress have less respect for you, um, because there's gossip going around. At the same time, um, it's affecting his effectiveness because he's exhausted. He's worn out. He's depressed. His popularity levels are falling. So that has to affect your ability to, to force change. And does that make him feel freer to speak out on more issues? Because what the hell? You know, I'm not going to be on, on Congress, on Capitol Hill, lobbying for the new fair housing bill. So I might as well attack the immorality of materialism and, and militarism? Maybe. I hadn't thought about it that way. And I certainly never heard him express it quite that clearly. Maybe if anybody else in the room wants to weigh in on that, I think it's a really great question. Anyone else have a comment on that? Or, or... Uh, I also was really impressed with the book, uh, especially his early life. And Oh, sorry. I was really impressed with the book, especially his early life and how you put that together and uh, the the heritage of, of activism. Um, uh, to pick up on this theme, uh, the uh, the FBI records, uh, I also really struggled with how to use them. Um, I was here in 1986 when David Garrow was at Dinkelschville Auditorium and Angela Davis stood up and said, Mr. Garrow, how do you justify using these slanderous records? I don't think he had a very good, good answer. Uh, if he did, I didn't remember it. But um, the, uh, 
the thing about it is uh, today in the Me Too movement, we are concerned with public figures' ethics. I always wondered why all these journalists did not pick up the FBI's slander campaign and collaborate. And I think your point out that they, they were affected by it and perhaps otherwise. Um, but there's a whole nother dimension. You said he was a preacher, not a politician. Uh, I think Peniel Joseph got it right. And this is where I was trying to come from too. Um, he's a preacher and a politician, a political strategist. Uh, and his relationship with Stanley Levison is really important. And that's, those are the records, those are the conversations that I, I think I found most useful. And I wonder um, how you came to appreciate, you came to appreciate in even more depth their relationship and how it was really a kind of a partnership. I think you're right, by 1967, King is more radical than Levison. Um, but I think actually King uh, takes that conversation to heart and backs off a little bit from the Leninism of the, of the Riverside speech. Uh, and so that, you know, the collaboration is sort of continued. Uh, but what did you learn about King as a political strategist uh, from those records? Because I think if, if ethically we are going to use them, that we need to, both corroborate them, but also enrich our understanding of how we try to change the world. Um, yeah. Um, I think the, 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 the tapes show that King was really improvising so much of the time and that in part because of the poor organization of the SCLC and in part because of the many things he was juggling at one time, I never felt like he had the kind of um, long-term political strategy and and he's balancing this feeling that he's a preacher and that he's out to save the soul of the nation with trying to get policy change at the same time and you know that's so rare to see somebody who sees themselves as a moral leader who also realizes that he has the potential and and that the government is going to be the most effective agent for change in the long run but and again, we could talk about this with others in the room. I don't feel like he ever really had a, a concerted strategy. And Stan Levison is one of the people who's trying to help him, guide him strategically. Bayard Rustin is trying to guide him strategically. But there's never a plan. You know, at one point, Andy Young goes to the Ford Foundation and asks for, for, for some grant money. And they say, where's your five-year plan? And they never even turn one in. Um, because I mean, it, it's heartbreaking. I'm sure those of us who work in the nonprofit world can relate to that, you know, where's your five-year plan? But I feel like King was always jumping into fires and and, and I'm not sure that, that he had one. I think he had a metier and I think it was really formed by Birmingham. And mm -hmm. I think part of the Poor People's March was an attempt, and I don't know if how, how much you capture this, I get to the end. Um, it was an attempt to deploy massive disruptive disruption of a city to dislocate the functioning of a city, this city being Washington DC. Um, and he had sort of shifted that if you're going to wind down the war in Vietnam, you're gonna to need to accelerate the war on poverty. Um, and these actually come out in the, in the Levison King, Andrew Young tapes. So I do see that, yeah, a lot of it was ad hoc, especially Birmingham. But there is also a sort of conscious strategy, how we're going to reorient this country, how are we going to stage an event that is nonviolent, but that captures the nation's and the world's attention the same way the, the rebellions, the urban rebellions. Yeah, that's right. Um, you know, Bernard Lafayette called King a, the greatest crowbar America ever produced. Yeah. And I think that's a good way of thinking about how he saw his role. He doesn't exactly have a long range plan. He's just going to go try to pry some things loose and try to force people to make change. And, um, and, and I think that maybe that's how he saw his role. Yeah. I wonder if you could talk a little more about um, the relationship between Peretta and, and Martin Luther King on the war issue. Did you find out things that maybe we didn't know about how she really is kind of prodding him to, to take an anti-war stand? It's, it's not only moral, it's political. Yeah, we, we don't have a lot of detail in how she was doing it. We don't have the letters between them. Um, sadly, we don't have a lot of, we don't have phone calls really between them. Um, 
yeah. though we should. I'm not sure why. This gives her public credit. She said, no, my, my yes. wife was leading. Me. And, and we do know that she is, you know, speaking out before he is and that she's often standing up at events when, when he's still, you know, trying to ease his way in or he's approaching cautiously. She's more aggressive sometimes than he is. The last thought, and I'll give this up. Um, the J. Edgar thing, it's a little more pointed. He said, he's a sick man and I'm sorry for him. Yes, you're right. That's not kind of milk toast, you know. <laughs> no, that's, that's a good point, yeah. yes. Anything else? One more question. <laughs> I am hoping someone will, will begin working on a Coretta biography. And I've been saying widely that to anybody who's interested, I am ready to help. But uh, I, you know, supposedly there's a um, there's a blue suitcase full of letters, personal letters between Coretta and Martin. And I think um, when those emerge, the uh, the book will really uh, be ready to be written if the uh, if the family ever lets hold of those letters, gives up those letters. She was working on a book with Barbara Meredith, and they split. Uh, the, the, the and Barbara Meredith published a book, um, but I don't know whether there was more material um, left on the table. All right, thank you very much. I want to thank everyone for coming for this wonderful conversation. Um, we will continue the conversation this afternoon uh, with a panel of some of the folks you heard from today. And it will also continue uh, tomorrow as well, um, uh, the conversation. So I want to thank everyone for that. But right now, we'll have a book signing outside where you can purchase this wonderful book. And Jonathan will be signing books as, as well. So I want to thank everyone for coming spending time with us and I hope we'll see you back here this afternoon. Thanks.